Hi, um, I'm Julia Jackson Forsberg. I am um, the co-founder and, and uh, a director of Critical Thinking Works. I am also most recently now uh, the managing director of student learning and achievement for a charter school network in New York City. So um, some of what we're going to talk about today in terms of like in terms of the real opportunities for, for building out content rich curriculum. Um, this is what this is what I've been um, you know presenting uh, to educators for the last year and a half or so and you know where my work is going to be focused um, going forward. So in terms of our agenda for for this session, I want to touch on some overarching issues <clears throat> and then really kind of focus in on some essentials um, of the common core for arts and cultural providers. We're going to take a look at, at, um, at what some of the, the implications of the Common Core are and then, and then be able to wrap up. Now one thing that I, that I should uh, warn you about is that I do tend to move around. I do tend to trip over my own feet. Um, and, and today I'm spilling things. So um, if, if I fall on you or spill my water onto you, I'm terribly sorry. It's just, you know, it's likely to happen. And if I say it, it probably won't. So um, <clears throat> there. So looking at background and context, um, you know, as, as I'm putting together uh, my thoughts and, and you know, wanting to talk about this with you, I've got these, these guiding questions. So how do the Common Core Standards affect arts and cultural providers? What are the changes to instructional practice that are implied by the Common Core Standards? These are not directly stated. They are, however, probably the, the biggest opportunity that, that's there embedded in the standards. How will these standards impact student learning and achievement? How are the current state standards aligned with Common Core standards? And what action items will ensure that you can provide added value to the schools? Um, <clears throat> feel free, just so you know, to ask me questions. I'm not, I'm not going to encourage the, um, the free-for-all shout-out behavior, you know, but, but do, I want this to be a conversation um, as much as anything else. So if you have questions, please you know, please stop and, and we can address them. So I like to, to start when, when I'm presenting about the Common Core, uh, start with some of the myths that are out there because they're still really rampant. Um, so myth number one, the Common Core standards will create a national curriculum. And at the state level too, you know, we're hearing all of this stuff about Engage New York. And I'm still hearing a lot of questions about whether or not the curriculum that's posted on Engage New York is creating a state curriculum. Okay? So the answer is no. There is no, you, you know, there's no drive to create a national curriculum. The materials that are out on Engage New York are great resources. They are freely available, but they are not mandated. So the state is saying, here's some, you know, here are some of the best providers in the country who have put together curriculum and, and instructional materials for our students, freely available, available to students in Kentucky too. But these are not mandated uh, um, as curriculum materials. This is important for your conversation. Um, the, there's this pervasive myth that the Common Core Standards will narrow the curriculum. Right, it's going to drive out everything but ELA and math. This will be true if people don't do it properly. But it's not true in anything that the standards documents themselves are saying. And as a matter of fact, the standards authors, that, um, the, core knowledge, um, the Core Knowledge Foundation, they've all come out to say, N no, no, that's, that's not what we mean. Don't do it that way, OK? Um, you know, the, the standards are a political initiative or an initiative from the Obama administration, as Michelle pointed out, this was an initiative that was really being driven by the, uh, the National Council of State Governors. So this is a state-led and opt-in uh, initiative. What's, you know, what's important there is that 46 out of 50 states have decided to opt in. The only ones who haven't are the, are the ones that you might assume. Um, you know, Virginia, Texas, Alaska, I don't know, some of the usual suspects, right? So, <clears throat> um, number well, four, what? What's the fourth one? What? The fourth one? Um, um, uh, it's, uh, no, no, it's not Montana. Montana has opted in. Um, no, uh, Mississippi is in. It's uh, Wisconsin, I believe. Okay. Wait a minute. I, I have it somewhere in my notes. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> But the, it's, it's really a state's rights issue, 
that is keeping those, those states out of the pool, right? So, fine. Um, number four here is probably the, the biggest myth that's out there. These standards represent a modest change from our current practice. I was just, um, I was just listening to a, uh, a presentation this morning that was happening at the Manhattan Institute, and they had the, you know, the, Merrill Tisch was presenting, the Chancellor of, of New York um, Board of Regents, um, and, uh, and also the, the president of the Core Knowledge Foundation, who's one, the Core Knowledge Foundation is one of the authors of the curriculum materials that are freely available on Engage New York. Um, this is <laughs> one, of the, one of the biggest myths that's still out there. The Common Core, when the Common Core standards were, were being written, they made sort of a three-way promise to, them, to, you know, to themselves as writers. They were aiming to do nothing short of uh, you know, transforming the way students learn by transforming the way teachers teach and then transforming the way we look at assessments and, and, um, and track data, okay? So this, this, these, are, these are big changes. And they're being downplayed, you know, when we talk about the instructional shifts, right? That sounds comfortable. We're just, we're shifting, right? Um, but in fact, you know, these are, these are instructional transformations. And, and some of the biggest transformations are going to be happening in the area of curriculum development and, and content knowledge. And that's where you guys are going to, you know, that's where you guys can plug in. Um, last ones, um, you know, we, we can't do this without additional money. That, I, I think is, hey, that just is what it is. The money isn't going to get any better, and the standards are here. Um, the Common Core standards will transform schools. Sadly, no. There is no standards document that can transform schools. It's only the, the instruction and the curriculum that, you know, that we're bringing to the schools, to our classrooms, that can actually transform the outcomes. And then, you know, these two shall pass. This is just another educational fad, and if we just ignore it long enough, it will go away. Um, I, I can just about guarantee now with David Coleman as the executive director of the college board that the SAT is going to start looking a whole lot more uh, like the, what we're seeing in, the, in Common Core expectations. This is not going to go away. So, and, and this is the right thing for a number of reasons, um, <clears throat> which we can talk about now. So this is the right thing for a number of reasons because of the data that was, being, that was being looked at and internalized by the Common Core Standards writers. So we have internationally declining US competitiveness on international assessments of math and reading. Um, <clears throat> on the PISA test, which is, um, which is a, a, an initiative of the uh, international Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, right? This is an organization that's looking internationally at what students around the world can do as a factor of the economic competitiveness of, of those nations. So here's where we are. The US in the last year available is 30th in math out of 65 countries, 23rd in science, and 17th in reading. China's number one in all of them. Um, and you know, so there it is. This, we're, we're losing sort of global market share, you know, for, uh, you know, for students who can compete at the highest levels and, and maintain, you know, sort of the innovation pipeline. And then in New York City, this was another data point that came, that came into, into play. There are these high rates, we hear about these high rates of college remediation. Um, the fact is that 75% of students who are entering community colleges in New York State require remedial coursework. The, the flip side of that is that 25% of students graduating from our high schools are measured as college and career ready by the ACT, right? So those match. <laughs> those match. And, you know, we're, we're hearing about the, the concern about you know, the declining test scores this year because this year New York is rolling forward with Common Core aligned assessments. Kentucky started this work last year and Kentucky's, um, 
Kentucky's data point fell, I think 25 to 30 points. New York State is predicting a 25 to 45% decline in scores this year. And everybody's concerned about that, right? Because teacher evaluation is tied to that. We, we have nothing to compare those tests to from previous years, but we can compare it to the, the output that's already, you know, I mean, we see here 25% of kids are college and career ready. We're kind of expecting the data point to drop um, by, you know, by that much. So that's not, I mean, that, that makes everybody feel bad, but it's also, you know, this is an opportunity to really dig into the, the potential in the Common Core to change those outcomes. Not, not modestly, but sort of boldly and courageously. Um, <clears throat> so why the Common Core? I mean, Michelle touched on, on the fact that, you know, the Common Core makes uh, internationally benchmarked standards for student performance. It is common across the states. So what we expect from students in Mississippi is now the same as what we expect in New York in, for students in New York and Massachusetts, right? This is all good. Um, <clears throat> it, it creates the first opportunity really for educators and cultural providers to collaborate across states. That's, you know, that's tremendously exciting in terms of sharing materials and resources and ideas. But <clears throat> here, here are two of the, the promises. These are uh, quotes from the introduction to the Common Core. And I just like to call attention to them because what's really behind the Common Core is the sense that we need to create the next generation of, of students who are truly college and career ready at the end of, of their high school experience. And then the second quote, which I love, is from the introduction to the math section of the Common Core, but I think it's equally applicable to ELA. These standards are not intended to be new names for old ways of doing business. They are a call to take the next step. It is time to recognize that standards are not just promises to our children, but promises we intend to keep. And I think you know, there's, there's no more sort of ringing uh, you know, declaration um, you know, of, of what we have failed to do for our students over the past 40 years. So Common Core Standards Design, I'm, I'm giving you this really quickly, but then I'm going to direct your attention to what I think you really need to, to pay attention to and know. Okay? The Common Core Standards develop grade level specific standards and they focus on outcomes rather than means. <clears throat> In terms of the ELA, it's an integrated mo a model of literacy, so it really eliminates the artificial separation between communications tasks and looks at reading, writing, speaking, and listening as, as one uh, whole exercise. Research, technology, and media skills are integrated throughout the curriculum, and it really, really, really firmly demands a shared responsibility for literacy development. <coughs> but what do you mean? Shared responsibility for literacy development. <coughs> that includes the students. Well, the students are, are the learners. So, okay. you know, so of, of course, you know, we, we, we share that responsibility in the classroom. But the teachers, it, this is really driving toward the teachers. And in looking at, um, basically, you know, and we have these standards for literacy development, we're, and you'll have heard something about the uh, informational text versus literacy text. We'll touch on that in a minute. But when you look at that shift for learning and for um, you know, exploring informational text, content, um, and literature, there was this whole hue and cry that, that in fact literature was being demoted in the curriculum and 70% you know, you know, of uh, instruction in the English class was going to need to encompass informational learning. That's just simply not it. If that's happening, a school is, is implementing incorrectly. So this shared responsibility is really for reading and writing across the curriculum and, you know, and investigating big ideas across the curriculum. Um, this is uh, just a quick quote. Um, this is a David Coleman um, go-to phrase. Um, you know, the, the, the standards really create that drive to 
read like a detective, and write like an investigative reporter. <clears throat> but now, thinking about the essentials for you guys, because there is, as Michelle said, this, this tome, right? And you can read through all of the standards, and they can still be clear as mud. So um, let's, let's just, I wanted to direct our attention to the anchor standards for reading. These, there are 10 anchor standards for, for reading, and that's it. If you really got to know these anchor standards, you would be doing just fine um, as arts and cultural providers. Because these anchor standards then sort of are, are parsed out for what students should be able to know and do against each standard at each grade level, okay? But even better, when you take a look at these standards, we can simplify it down to this. <clears throat> the, the anchor standards are asking us to always um, you know, work with students to articulate evidence, right? <clears throat> we want to be driving students to analyze central ideas in a text or in a, in a, in a work that we're exploring. And you know, as Michelle started to touch on, you know, in, in the past, a lot of times, you know, we, we were driving toward, you know, what do we feel about this? Well, well, we'll talk about that too, but the standards are asking us to stop asking high school students, especially high school students, because no one wants to know what they're feeling, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, we're, you know, we need to ask them to, to think about and analyze central ideas. Um, we're, we need to, to ask for, you know, what the interaction is within, within a work that creates that meaning. We need to focus on vocabulary. And this is not just like what they call tier three words, the, the language of your specific domain. This is using big words in conversation with students and, you know, and, and offering them, offering them, you know, text and experiences that will stretch their vocabulary. The, and, and, and uh, focus on the, the language of power, if you mean, yeah, if you will. Um, we want to always look at structure um, and how structure creates meaning. So that's, I mean, we talk about structure in a poem, in a, in a work of art, right? Um, in, in, a, in a drama. Um, we want to look at how point of view and, and author's purpose or purpose shapes meaning. We want to always be integrating Multimedia, you know, and, and looking at, at, um, at ideas and knowledge through both text, video resources, visual resources, audio resources. <clears throat> we want to work with students to make and defend arguments. So this is really about, you know, thinking in terms of, you know, arts and culturals, a culture of critique. And then looking at multiple, multiple texts or multiple works that are, that are centered around a particular theme or, or content strand. Range of complexity, that's, its, that's a, whole, a whole other issue. But I took a stab at, at kind of rewriting the anchor standards for reading with more of, of a look toward what arts and cultural providers do. So instead of reading closely, I, I mean, as Michelle has uh, pointed out, you know, I, I love semiotics. Everything can be read. Um, but we don't often think that way when we look at the word text, right? So instead of read, you can look at that first anchor standard and, and think in terms of like read, look, listen, watch closely to determine what the work is saying, right? What, what the work communicates explicitly and implicitly, right? Um, I will make sure that, that you have a copy of, of the whole presentation if you would like it. Um, but, you know, but again, this, this is just my, my thinking for how this translates over to the language of the arts and culturals. Um, the other thing that you should really take, um, pay close attention to here is not the standards for math, because the standards for math are, you know, they're math. <laughs> you know? Um, you, you're in, you know, as arts and cultural providers, you're not going to be really thinking about how to teach students how to multiply. But if you look at the standards for math practice, there are six of them. 
These are things that, that you, I'm sure, are doing all the time. Ha helping students make sense of problems and persevere in solving them. Reason abstractly and quantitatively. Const uh, construct viable arguments and critique the reasoning of others. Like I said, that culture of critique. Model with mathematics. That is something that I'm certain that, you know, that is within the realm of what you might be able to do too. Use appropriate tools strategically and attend to precision. Sounds a lot like, you know, like the, the practice of, you know, of arts and cultural providers. It sounds like the practice of good workforce development too, <laughs> right? So, and then, uh, you know, Michelle started to talk about this, um, the fundamental shifts in ELA. I'm just going to touch on these because um, we're going to dig a little bit more deeply into, into some of these shifts, but here they are. <coughs> there are six shifts, but student achievement partners has really sort of boiled them down into three. I mean, you, everybody can handle three things. Um, so the first shift is really about building knowledge. And this is a key opportunity for arts and cultural providers. You're, you're thinking about helping students, helping schools to build coherent knowledge. Require text evidence. Again, require evidence for what you're saying. Right? If you have, if you have a, a discussion activity with a group of students, what makes you think that? You know, what, what in what we just did made you, know, made you come to that conclusion? <clears throat> and then, you know, reliance on complex text and academic language. Okay? So, now in math, these are the six shifts. They really, they go to focus, coherence, and rigor. When we talk about these shifts, as, as you guys might be able to uh, plug into them, we're really going to focus on the last, uh, the last shift which is about rigor, which is a three-pronged definition of rigor. It's, it's really wonderful. This is the first time, I think, in the history of standards that anyone has gone out on a limb to define what rigor in math is. And so rigor in math is now, across the country, fluency with math facts and procedural skills, conceptual understanding, and real-world application. These, you know, th these are areas that, that I'm sure you can, you, know, you can all plug into. So if we look a little bit more, more deeply here, this is another David Col Coleman quote. Um, it came out of a, a webinar that happened back in March. And the webinar was titled Truant from School because there was this, um, there was this study that came out that was um, identifying that about 70% or, or greater of all US teachers were, were thinking that the Common Core was going to require a narrowing of the curriculum so that we were going to be driving science, social studies, and the arts out of our buildings. And the Common Core um, authors went out, and, and the, uh, you know, the, the foundation president for the Common Core hosted this webinar to say, no, that's simply not true. And if you think that, please disabuse yourself of that notion. Um, and this, you know, this is a quote that you'll see out, out and about on the internet quite a lot. David Coleman said, there is no such thing as doing the nuts and bolts of reading in kindergarten through grade five without coherently developing knowledge in science and history and the arts, period. Okay, so what, is, what does that mean? Um, on the webinar that I was on this morning, uh, one of the speakers articulated that these were the 47 most important words in the Common Core State document, or the Common Core Standards document. Here they are. While the standards make references to some particular forms of content, including mythology, foundational US documents, and Shakespeare, they do not, indeed cannot, enumerate all or even most of the content that students should learn. The standards must therefore be complemented by a well-developed, content-rich curriculum. And here is where a lot of people are going astray in the implementation, okay? Because, you know, there's this urge to kind of double down on, on reading skills. Um, and, per, you know, I've, I've heard, um, you know, of, of schools wanting to have sustained silent reading time in, in music class. If this is happening, we're, you know, we're missing, you know, we're missing the forest for the trees, okay? So, 
<clears throat> in terms of building knowledge, the standards are asking us, ah, the standards really acknowledge, and this is, this is like Edie Hirsch's shining moment because for the last, what, 30 years, he's been decried as a crazy conservative. Um, and, and in fact, here we are at this moment where, you know, what he's been saying for the past how many years, 25 years, is really becoming the, the new rules of the road, okay? So what the standards are acknowledging is that background knowledge is linked to comprehension. And that comprehension, and you know, that building comprehension and background knowledge actually impacts student intelligence, right? There is no comprehension without background knowledge. Just doesn't happen. You can, you know, most of us can decode fluently a physical chemistry textbook, but maybe not understand it, right? So, <clears throat> so building, building knowledge is the, the missing foundational piece in driving forward our, our ability to, you know, to have students succeed on these high stakes tests. Well, what students are able to, to know, you know, what, what they understand about the, I mean, okay, so this is, Edie Hirsch, you know, came out 30 years ago and said that, that students needed to know a core body of knowledge. And, and that became controversial for, for a number of, of different reasons, but, but I think that we can all acknowledge that it's important that we sort of share, like, we all know who Mozart is and what the Statue of Liberty is. And, um, I, I don't, you know, I mean, there's, there's, there is sort of shared understanding of, you know, of content if we're well educated. Yeah, arts and culture. Yeah, it's your culture. Yeah, it, it is your culture. And, and um, so, you know, the other, the other point that got made on, on the webinar that I was listening to this morning is that building cultural knowledge is, the, is really the only way that we can truly eliminate the achievement gap because students who are coming from middle class households come in with a wealth of shared knowledge, right? We take our kids to museums and, um, you know, we take our kids on trips and so on. Um, it's the students in the, in the low SES bracket who don't have those shared experiences and can't take that background knowledge for granted. So in schools and in schools we've failed to build it. Um, <clears throat> so. The core documents really point to three things. We need to teach students about Shakespeare, myth, and the foundational works of uh, the, you know, the American culture. They don't say which ones those are. <laughs> <laughs> um, but then, you know, but, <laughs> well, yes, and yes, yes, we are supposed to know it, but at the same time, you know, they, they didn't want to say, you, you know, it, uh, enumerating that list could be kind of dangerous because somebody might forget to include, somebody yeah. Like the great yeah. Right. Um, and then additionally, within this building background knowledge, <clears throat> we've got this, which was, which was controversial um, when the standards documents came out, you know, this, this idea that we need to increase at our emphasis on informational text. Scared everybody, right? Because it looks as though if you just kind of glance at that, it looks as though we want 70% of English time to be spent on informational text, and that's not it. We, j we want to make sure that kids are actually doing quality reading in science and in social studies. Shocking. <laughs> um, yeah. I'm, that's a that's a terrific question. So, your question is, um, you know, how can teachers accomplish this without extensive professional development, and what are the professional development models that are that are driving it? Those that's up to the individual districts and schools networks to to provide. And the truth of the matter is, I I don't you know there's there's a lot of room for growth and improvement here. So you know if you're thinking that way. 
um, you know, perhaps, you know, perhaps this organization could, you know, could host a professional development for, for districts, um, you know, uh, to, to really look at how, how you can build out this kind of content-rich curriculum. And, and bring in things like, you know, out of, out of school opportunities. Because the truth of the matter is that the best, uh, you know, the best content-rich curriculum is going to be building connected brains. You know, so students are reading about something in the classroom, going out to the science museum and, and, and seeing an exhibit, or you know, going to the zoo and 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 seeing something that they've just they've just learned about, or, or going to the Albright Knox and, and connecting you know works of art with some big thematic ideas that, that they are exploring in their classroom. That is going to to build those kinds of connected brains, right? Where information comes in and it has a friend, so it stays at the party, right? Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> this, is, this is good. I mean, mm -hmm. it's okay to say teachers, let's just make a checklist. Mm -hmm. But we don't have a bunch of idiots out there either. No, and, and you know, I think, I'm, I'm glad that you bring that up because I don't think that anyone is saying that the teachers have, are, are, you know, are not, you know. Right, but they're not starting from but, scratch. But a lot of this, where it's being done well, is being done in isolation. So, you know, there, there are schools that are, that are doing this well or, or perhaps, you know, classrooms, teachers, or groups of teachers, a grade level team, but but this isn't what we see as the as normative. Um, right. Yep. I have a question about the American part of that. Are yeah. they are they um, then saying that any kind of global connection that you're making can you address that somehow? Because it seems to me seventeenth to twentieth uh, century works that are foundational American works in art. Mm -hmm. Are, are so sort of in conversation with other parts of the world. Uh, and I, I totally agree with you. So, you know, I mean, if, if you were to, if you were to um, take sort of an, an anchor text or an, an anchor work mm -hmm. and connect it to those things that it's in conversation with, that's even, that's even better. You know, that, that is a richer, you know, that is a, a richer learning opportunity. But, you know, there, um, there aren't as many specific things that are, well, those are the only, excuse me, those are the only three things that are specifically referenced as must-haves. And then, you know, the text types, uh, you know, uh, sort of uh, expand out from there um, once you get into the, the documents themselves. So, again, you will, you will have this. Um, in terms of you know, things that you can specifically do to ensure that you're, you know, you're helping add value and, you know, and, and help shape the, the, the curricular conversations. Um, it, you know, in your organizations or, or with partner schools, design those op learning opportunities that are, that are going to promote um, and enhance the interconnection of knowledge and ideas across content areas and really focus on that issue of cultural literacy. Um, also, Really, help teachers and administrators resist the irrational urge to, uh, to have students reading in, in music classes. I mean, you know, sustained silent reading. <coughs> reading in music class, that's, that's a different thing. I mean, maybe you have an article um, that is about Mozart. But, you know, I mean, there, there's, there's concern out there that um, schools will kind of double down on those reading skills. <coughs> This is, um, this is going to that, that issue of requiring text evidence, that second grouped shift. And I, I just wanted to put that out there because here within reading, writing, um, and speaking and listening, we have profound emphasis in the, stat in the standards on students articulating and justifying their reasoning. So for arts and culturals, I mean, if you are it, you know, and, and for teachers, if we are always, <laughs> see, mm -hmm. there I go. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm trying really hard to help it. <laughs> if, if we're always, you know, driving discussion and, and student writing back to the evidence at hand, you know, what makes you think that? You know, what in what, what, in what we just did, you know, drew you to that conclusion, rather than I'm, I'm really glad that you feel that way or, you know, connect to, you know, my, yeah, my grandma does that too. Um, that, is a, that is a richer and um, more... In, more evidence-based conversation. Um, you know, getting students to focus on rigorous collegial discussions, essentially promoting a, you know, that culture of critique. 
um, in, in all of the, you know, in all of the materials that, that, that we provide. <coughs> the red line here is the, the break between the third and fourth quartiles. And then we, ha we have the Lexile band measures for the stuff kids are asked to read in high school, the literature kids are asked to read in college, high school textbooks, college textbooks, the military. And then over here, this is where our personal use it is falling. Entry level occupations, this isn't like working in McDonald's, but entry level occupations. And then the SAT. So you can just see, just at a, at a glance, that what we're asking kids to do is not getting them to the ranges that they, they need to, to operate in successfully in order to be successful in college and career. Make sense? <coughs> this, I think, is, you know, is another one of those, those, those images to kind of burn in, <laughs> share, and, and show. Yeah? So what, what is Lexile? Mean? Lexile is simply a quantitative measure of reading difficulty. It's what a com computer can measure. So it's measuring sentence length, um, frequency of word repetition, um, and, and a few other things to create a, a numbered score. That right. tells you how complicated the text is. Right. And when we actually look, this is worth it, I, I think, too, for, for you guys to know. When we're looking at text complexity, we're not just looking at quantitative measures. We're also looking at qualitative measures like levels of meaning and then reader and task consideration like background knowledge and whether you're asking students to infer based on, on what you're doing with them. But um, the, the Lexile, you know, like Jane Eyre is a very high Lexile level. I want to say it's 1300. Not that I've looked it up or anything. Um, <clears throat> and, um, and, and then like a very, very uh, popular book, um, yeah. <laughs> Shades of Grey is like a four. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, no, um, the House of the Scorpion. Uh, are you guys familiar with that? It's a it's a pretty popular middle school book. Mm -hmm. Where would you put Harry Potter? Harry Potter. I actually looked at that. Harry Potter runs somewhere in the like I want to say eighth grade Lexile band. Um, it, so it's actually a higher reading level than a lot of young adult fiction, mm -hmm. um, a, a eighth or ninth grade band. Um, and so, so something like House of the Scorpion, which I've seen used in high schools, is a great seventh grade text. You know, so it, it's, um, it just a, it's a way for all of us to think about, like, are we giving kids material that's challenging enough and then, and then helping them to be successful with that challenging material? So in terms of, you know, again, action items that, that you guys can be thinking about, you know, focusing on questioning strategies <clears throat> that really prompt students to unpack the unique complexity of any work. Um, you know, choosing texts that support and value divergent thinking, because a lot of times, you know, we've, we've, we've got this, this idea out there that right is right, right? And um, in fact, what the Common Core standards are asking us to do is to kind of open up that conversation. We as, we as a country need to get better, maybe, <laughs> at being able to listen to, respond, and build consensus with people who don't share our ideas. Um, I don't know. My evidence for that is the sequester. Um, <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, somehow this is brought into this, this framework which says now this is your part in mm -hmm. how we're going to develop critical thinking or something like that so they understand where all this is coming from. Mm -hmm. Because a teacher can say, well, you're going to read this book and by the end of the year we're going to do this. Yep. But they, that's what I meant by share. Where does this business share come into the process? Uh, quite honestly, I, I, I agree with you entirely. You know, that students should, should be taught to formulate their own questions. It's one of, it's one of the things that, that um, Dan Meyer, one of, one of my favorite speakers on, on the math common core shifts, has, has actually said that, you know, we need students to be part of formulating problems and asking their own questions. 
because the person, you know, th that person is doing the thinking. But if they aren't taught the skills to do that with, yep. they can't do it. You're correct. And, you know, and so, you know, that's why we see in the, you know, in the speaking and listening standards and in the work of, of you know, in, in all of the work of your workshops, in the work of the classrooms, um, we have to teach students not only how to ask those questions, but how to be good listeners, how to respond, you know, how to, how to respond to critique constructively, how to, how to give critique constructively. Because they have to know what the, what, the, what the goal is. Hmm? So your goal is, you know, we want students to understand the text and learn stuff that's in the text. Mm -hmm. Rather than just throwing something at them and saying we want to be able to read this, mm -hmm. they have to be given the tools with which to say, oh, okay, I've got to learn something from what I'm reading, you know. Yep. And um, they have to know that that's what they're doing. Mm -hmm. I, and, and I agree with you. There's a, a book that, that, I, um, that came out somewhere in the last six months, and it's um, from Harvard Education Press. I want to say that the title is Change One Thing, and it's, it's really looking at how to teach students to ask questions so that students can, you know, can help be the, the driver of, of learning and, um, and questioning in classrooms. So, um, So I, here we're shifting over to, to math. These, you know, this is the third of those fundamental shifts in math. And here, like I said, for the first time, the Common Core goes out and, and defines what rigor is in mathematics. Procedural skill and fluency, that's sort of the bedrock. Solid conceptual understanding. And then application of skills in problem solving situations. Um, rigor as fluency means that students can, with speed and accuracy, do stuff, right? They know their multiplication tables. They can, you know, they, they know what, what formula to, to use without having to think about it. Um, so that's what rigor as fluency is. And then there's rigorous conceptual understanding. And here, I think, is a really, um, is a really interesting opportunity for arts and cultural providers because Conceptual understanding is not what we're teaching for mm, very often. Um, the, the image there is of you know, uh, the butterfly method of factoring equations, which works every time. It's a great little device that actually plays hide the math. I don't know why that works. It just does. You know, so what the Common Core is, is basically asking us all to do is to think about how, how can we find ways to stop playing hide the math, right? And to, to really make sure that, under, that students understand how to solve a problem. <laughs> I'm going to skip this um, just because we're running out of time. But I would recommend that you Google a man named Dan Meyer. Um, M-A-Y-E-R. Um, he, um, he, he has a, a terrific TED talk on what rigorous application would look like. And what, it, what we really need to do is think about how, how students can apply math to real world situations. Because, you know, for, for the life of me, I can measure all of the spaces in my front hallway, but I still can't figure out how many rolls of, of wallpaper I need, right? <laughs> um, and, and, and it's this kind of real world application that, that's right at, at all of your fingertips, right? Um, you know, you can think about how, how students might use math, um, you know, in a theater setting and, and, and so on. <laughs> Ultimately, the standards are asking us to really increase both rigor and relevance. It's kind of that D quadrant there where we're, we're looking at, at applying math in real world situations that give us unpredictable results. And, and I think truly that there's, you know, that there's tremendous opportunity for arts and cultural um, providers to think about helping schools do that well. So um, you know, we need to look at developing frequent opportunities to build student understanding, have math serve the conversation rather than have the conversation serve the math. Um, and then again, here, this is just beautiful. Questioning, you know, making sure that there are questioning and justification strategies inside, you know, those those math applications, um, because we don't just want to. I mean, you don't. We we want to build those opportunities for students to get something wrong, mm -hmm. and for students 
or for teachers, workshop providers to say something other than, nope, you're wrong, thanks for playing, who's got the right answer, right? <coughs> so um, this, is, um, this is basically a, a slide that I've put together from um, a book called Literacy with an Attitude. The bottom line here is that many of our schools are operating in, in at best, the middle class paradigm. And the, the real goal of education, as it's articulated in the Common Core, is to drive us all out, you know, into the, into the range of, into the paradigm that's at work in more affluent schools, where knowledge is, you know, is rigorous, is connected, work is reasoning, problem solving, and, and you know, individual creativity. Evaluation isn't just about sitting down and doing the worksheet and, and staying quiet and staying in your classroom. It's about really you know, coming up with original and excellent ideas. Um, and that, you know, that, that we, have, we have school communities that are, that are really driving us toward excellence. So um, I guess you know, that is my, uh, you know, that's my, my final slide to, to think about. I will make sure that you have it. And I'd be happy to send you some material from this book because I think that what the Common Core is asking us to do is really um, eliminate the, the socioeconomic stratification of educational outcomes. So thank you. <laughs>